My name is Jeanette Vincendo, and I've just written a book called Jean-Pierre Melville, An American in Paris. Um, in fact, an ironic title as part of my point in writing the book is to show that Melville was both a director very influenced by American cinema, but by no means somebody who made copies of American film, a very French filmmaker, in fact. Um, and Melville was, I, I believe, one of the most important and interesting directors in French cinema in the post-war period, but somebody who's been uh, ignored for quite a while, um, had trouble with the critics in the 1960s, and yet has been recently rediscovered. And I think it's interesting to go back to um, his career and life to understand why that is the case. He started his career in 1947 and ended it in 1972 with his last film, his 13th feature, Un Fleek, before he died at the age of 55 in 1973. And these films, many of which have become uh, great classics of French cinema, belong to roughly two genres. He made uh, a number of gangster films, uh, which are the ones he's really famous for nowadays. But he also made a number of resistance films, films about the Second World War and the occupation of France. So, so there, there's the, this double interest. Um, but across that, there are also interesting continuities. And I believe that to, to understand Melville, uh, there are three keys. And one, the first one is his own personality, a very independent, very obstinate, very difficult even person. The second thing is his absolute passion for the cinema, and especially American cinema and American culture in general. And the third one is, is the war, and in particular his part in the resistance. Very interestingly, he began his career in the post-war period uh, in, in filmmaking, but he came from outside the cinema. He didn't do what um, was the tradition at the time to begin by uh, apprenticeship, training with other directors and so on. Uh, he actually started straight away as an independent filmmaker, making his own short film, which was called 24 Hours in the Life of a Clown, um, completely independently, shot on location. And, and that, that was something quite unusual at the time. Uh, he also then, um, a few years later, started building his own studio, another extremely unusual thing for a French director. Uh, there were really only two or three precedents before him. His first feature film uh, in 1947, which was called Le Silence de la Mer, uh, which was a, a book adaptation from a famous resistance novel, was, was actually a film which he made without any permission, either from the writer of the book or from the film industry. He was actually, uh, then when he made the film, fined by the authorities of the French film industry for, for having violated the rules. So there was right from the start, there was a kind of iconoclastic, rule-breaking personality who was making his voice felt in, in French cinema. With his independent spirit was a very um, difficult personality also. Melville was a perfectionist and, and many of his collaborators have said how difficult he was to work with. Uh, he was a bit of a, a tyrant on, on the set, uh, even went as far as saying he didn't want people to have affairs because that detracted from uh, the seriousness of the business of filmmaking. The actor Yves Montand, um, on Melvin's death, I paid him tribute by saying he was somebody who was incredibly difficult, but you had to respect him. And, and many of his collaborators have paid tribute to that, that duality of somebody who was very uh, a hard taskmaster, a very difficult personality, uh, a very controlling figure, authoritarian, and yet also deeply respected um, because of his expertise. I think the second key to understanding Melville and the mystery of the man and the filmmaker is his absolute passion, all-consuming passion for the cinema and for American cinema in particular and American culture. Uh, when Melville was, was a child for his seventh birthday, his uh, parents, who must have been fairly unconventional for the time, gave him a small camera, um, what was known at the time as a pâté baby, a pâté baby camera, um, which, which used the 9.5 millimeter gauge. And, and so he, he used that to start a uh, little bit of filming. And then when he was old enough and he started going to the cinema, he said that 
it was an absolute amour fou, a sort of all-consuming passion that he would go to the, the cinemas on the, the Grand Boulevard in Paris, um, starting at 9 a.m. and sometimes going on until 3 a.m., kind of watching movie after movie. And, and, and that really sowed the seed of his uh, absolute passion for the cinema. Uh, and I think in that, uh, he also prefigures, very interestingly, the filmmakers of the new wave, who a generation later almost would do the same and would learn the cinema by watching movies. I think Melville was very typical of somebody who grew up um, as a young man, then in the, uh, the wartime and the immediate post-war period, in the Parisian uh, intellectual milieu, which venerated American literature and American cinema. Uh, and he was really steeped in that milieu, so he belonged to a, the kind of intelligentsia who frequented the, um, the cabarets and the nightclubs of Saint-Germain-des-Prés in Paris, listened to jazz, loved jazz from a young age as well, loved the cinema, loved American literature. And in particular, he said three writers were, were extremely important for him, Faulkner, uh, Edgar Allan Poe, and Herman Melville. And of course, it's Herman Melville from whom he took his name, the name we know him under as a filmmaker. As a matter of fact, it's a name that was apparently in the Middle Ages, a French name that emigrated to um, Britain and then America. So, so there's a nice kind of Franco-American exchange that goes on there. And I think that name, Jean-Pierre Melville, is also um, then itself concentrates that duality between Frenchness and Americanness that, that is so important to Melville. Melville was famous for wearing um, hats, for wearing Trilby hats first from kind of gangster movies and then Stetson hats from the Western. Um, so some um, claim that it was also because it conveniently hid the fact that he was balding, but nevertheless it was also something that um, advertised in a very ostentatious way his love of America, of America and American culture. In 1961, Melville was interviewed by um, Cahiers du Cinéma and um, very famously published with that interview uh, his pantheon of American directors, which consists of 64 names. They actually range from makers of, of um, westerns like John Ford to uh, directors of musicals, um, people one has never heard of. And what I think that list says is that what he loved was not a particular director or a particular style or a particular genre even, but the whole idea of classical American cinema. That for him it was a kind of cinema that was uh, the epitome of an entertaining cinema, but that's at the same time a cinema that was well made, uh, evidence of a professionalism which he aimed to, to duplicate. Melville's passion for American cinema then found an outlet in his own filmmaking when he started making gangster films, starting in 1956 with Bob Le Flambeur and going up to the end of his career in 1972 with Un Flic. I think the gangster film can be seen as Melville's way of paying tribute to American cinema in a way which is plausible in a French context, because of course he couldn't make westerns in France. Uh, and although he has said that some of his gangster films, such as Le Cercle Rouge, can be understood as westerns, uh, transposed to a French context, clearly the gangster film, which itself had a history in French cinema, could work uh, in a French context, to, could bring in American iconography in a French context in a way which the western simply couldn't. There are two f main phases in Melville's gangster films. They are the early ones, especially Bob Le Flambeur in 1956 and Deux Hommes dans Manhattan in 1959. And these two films are at a time where Melville is still quite close to the new wave. And they're films which are mostly shot on location, um, which are really poetic reflections on the city, Paris in Bob Le Flambeur and New York in Deux Hommes dans Manhattan. There are films that are reflections on jazz and, of course, the iconic presence of the American gangster. So it's that conjunction of the American icon, the Bogart-style gangster with the hat and the trench coat, 
on the streets of Montmartre, shot on location. And that, that is the, the, the real pleasure that is derived from the film. And in fact, in that film, which is supposed to be a heist movie, um, we don't even see the heist. Um, and the first 45 minutes of the film are spent with Bob meandering the streets of Montmartre. So, so th it's a different project, really. And then with Deux Hommes dans Manhattan, in which Melville himself appears as one of the leads, uh, we have two men meandering the streets of New York, going into nightclubs and jazz studio recordings and so on. Um, a real, the love for the city is really what, what comes through the film. And again, a, and a great jazz score, um, like Bob Le Flambeur. And then from 1963 onwards, Melville moved into a different gear and started making what many regard as his great series of films, with Le Doulos in 1963, Le Deuxième Souffle in 66, Le Samurai 67, Le Cercle Rouge 70, and then Un Flic 72. They represent what for most people is the, the, the classic Melville. Films that are very laconic, that are very pared down visually, that make very sparse use of music. Je arrête quand on va descendre. Paul a tiré de placer derrière lui. Hein? Vous nous avez. Ben, tu penses il est pas aveugle. Hein? Salut Cilien, ça va? The actors themselves um, have very pared down performances. So, in Le Doulos, for example, Belmondo, who is normally quite an ebullient actor, uh, is, is much more laconic, much more restrained. Um, and I think that's why Alain Delon, who has naturally this kind of very uh, restrained kind of performance, became the actor of choice for Melville and, and starred in his last three gangster films. The other thing which uh, I think is really important to Melville's gangster films, um, especially those of the 60s, is that at the same time as there were a play on the American genre of the gangster film and tributes to particular films like John Huston's The Asphalt Jungle or Robert Wise's Odds Against Tomorrow and many others, there were also films that one can see as personal reflections on a very pessimistic universe on masculinity, especially um, a very melancholy form of masculinity, uh, on the futility of effort. The way to understand the, um, the deep pessimism that one can see at work in Melville's gangster films, well, in all Melville's films, in fact, I think is both a personal um, pessimism uh, Melville said that he was a solitary figure, even though he lived, he was married, he lived with his wife, but he said that he lived a solitude for five with his wife and his three cats um, in his flat above the studio. He famously liked to work at night or to recreate the night by blacking out his um, office um, above the studio and working either at, throughout the day and the night in darkness. So there, there is a kind of a personal um, pessimism which, uh, and loneliness and melancholy, which, is, which one can see as relating to the figure of Melville himself. But there is also something which is uh, in the culture at large. If we remember that Melville grew up in the um, Parisian intellectual milieu of the post-war period, um, where the philosophy of, of existentialism was uh, in vogue at the time, that he frequented um, a number of intellectuals and writers of the period, then I think one can understand that his um, dark, uh, pessimistic outlook was something that pertained to that milieu, and which, of course, was also influenced by the war, that, that the, there was a sense in which the break of the war um, provoked a sense of anxiety, a sense of uh, pessimism, um, which one sees duplicated in the culture at large with um, developments like the theater of the absurd, like the new novel. The third key for understanding Melville is the war and the impact of the war itself and also the resistance, both on his life and his work. Um, Melville was a soldier already, he was doing his military service when the war broke out, and 
very quickly he joined the resistance as well. Melville um, is the one who, whose life, whose entire life and career after the war can be seen in the light of the trauma that was the Second World War on France. Um, the, the shame of the defeat of the armistice of the German occupation uh, was something that he has talked about. And when much, much later he saw Marcel Ophüls' film, uh, Le Chagrin et la Pitié, uh, The Sorrow and the Pity, he said uh, what we all felt was, was shame. It's that very strong feeling of shame and corruption is something that one can then find in his work. Um, throughout his career, Melville made three main films that relate explicitly, directly to the war. His very first film, Le Silence de la Mer, which came out in 49, um, a film he made in 1961, Léon Morin Prêtre, and also um, a film he made towards the end of his career, L'Armée des Ombres, in 1969. And all three films are based on famous books, um, famous resistance and occupation novels. And in fact, the, the first one, Le Silence de la Mer, and the last one, L'Armée des Ombres, are books which Melville said he discovered in London while, himself, while he was himself in the resistance. As well as having three films which are um, explicitly about the war and about the resistance, there is a sense in which the, the war and the resistance are, as it were, structuring absence in his other films, that somehow they're always under the surface, they're there, um, the, the subject is always there under the surface. So for example, in Deux Hommes dans Manhattan, which is a film about New York, about jazz, um, uh, it's suddenly one finds towards the end of the film that the, the mystery, the solution to the mystery of the film is that um, the person who was um, missing and has been found was a hero of the resistance. There is also um, the sense in which his gangster films themselves could be seen as in a, a covert, indirect way about the topic as well. Um, the sense of secrecy, the sense of loyalty and betrayal, uh, the sense of nostalgia for the pre-war period, that things have become vitiated with uh, the German occupation. I think he's very strong as well in, in his gangster films. The one important thread in Melville's work, uh, and an unavoidable one um, when one knows the films, is masculinity. Melville said that he liked women a lot, but he loved men's stories. And I think that, that, that says um, quite a lot about his attitude. His films are not devoid of, of misogyny. Um, in both in the, the male focus and the representation of women. But on the one hand, it's, it's a misogyny that clearly found an echo in society. So he was, in that sense, a man of his time. Uh, we're talking about pre-feminist days. But also, uh, his male heroes are hardly triumphant machos. They're very melancholy figures. Um, they're, they're figures who are usually doomed, they're fated, they lead a very solitary existence. So that one can also see, in a way, through that portrayal of masculinity, uh, its own critique. The sense that his men exist without women, but this is not something that leads them to fun or happiness or worldly goods, but actually to uh, doom melancholy, loneliness and death. The films show the futility of effort. For Melville it was the uphill struggle to failure. Um, the films spend a lot of time showing us men um, constructing um, projects with extreme skills, uh, whether it's for the resistance or whether it's for a, a heist in, at the jewelers, and yet all those efforts are inevitably doomed to fail. So. It's interesting to reflect on why such a cinema could have been so popular. Why, why, why is it that the more austere and the more pessimistic his films, the more popular they were? And I think that in the end, the reason is the pleasure in the filmmaking, that this takes us back to Melville's love of American cinema, a cinema which he said could be entertaining as well as express serious concern. And so he used a medium he loved um, and, and the medium on which he reflected throughout the process of filmmaking to express those very deeply pessimistic concerns. But, it, but the films themselves are not 
pessimistic, they're not depressing because uh, the, uh, the brilliance of the, of the mise-en-scene, the, um, the pleasure in filmmaking is evident throughout. Uh, Melville's cinema is a, a cinema of great virtuosity, great pleasure in the text, in, in filmmaking itself. And I think that's what makes it ultimately a popular cinema. And he used a very interesting image, one might say a very typically French image, to uh, define his own cinema. And, and um, I wanted to conclude on that. Um, and it, it's a gastronomic image of, the, of a cake, a uh, millefeuille. And Melvin said, my, I want my cinema to be like a millefeuille, which is a cake made of layers of pastry and cream. And he said that some will taste the pastry and the others will taste the cream. The, most, the more discerning will taste the pastry and others will just perceive the cream. But that is what, what I want. So, and I think this notion of a double address, an address to uh, an audience who is simply looking for popular entertainment, but also an address to an audience who is looking for deeper meaning, um, really sums up um, Melvis' ethos, but also the pleasure of his cinema.